Welcome back. In today's lesson, we're going to change our attention from flexural moment analysis and design of cross sections to now shear and the diagonal tension that is kind of a related component of that. Right. We're fortunate that the analysis methodology that ACI chooses to use follows a, a mechanics-based approach. And so if you recognize the formula below, that tau is equal to VQ over IT, this was the formula for shear stress in a cross-section. Right? Um, and a lot of what we do doesn't use exactly this formula because this is rather cumbersome to use, but it does have its roots in this, in this equation. So if you recall, just kind of as a refresher, the tau, the shear stress, is going to be equal to VQ over IT, all right, where V is the applied shear at the section we're looking at. Q is the first moment of area, and this is the guy that's kind of computationally intensive, not too bad, and then the moment of inertia of the cross-section, um, I, and T is the thickness or the width at the location of interest. So if you have you know, a rectangular section, you know, and this is my neutral axis, then T is this width, okay, whereas if I have some sort of T beam, you know, then depending on whether I want the shear stress here, it's this width, if I want the shear stress here, it's this width, okay, and then of course Q will set itself up as being the area above or below the point that I'm interested in. So say I want tau max, which always occurs with the neutral axis, then I would find the area of this and multiply it by that distance. So that's some y value, if you will. So that's kind of how we do Q. If you have questions with how to capture Q, um, we'll have a video up on how to do section property calculations here shortly. But otherwise, you may have to you know, refer back to the mechanics book on how to calculate that. But it's, a kind, of, it's kind of a weird entity. Um, for calculating, but it's called the first moment of area. So, all right. Now, what we know about behavior of concrete under these loads, okay, is, is that cracking in concrete is usually caused by some form of principal stress. Now, what I've got here is I've got a kind of a basic element, you know, for a simply supported uniformly loaded beam. And what we've done is we've defined a couple of regions. Um, one is the the centroid of the section, and two is some arbitrary point down below. Okay, and what we can do is we can look at kind of the behavior of stresses on this particular picture, all right? So the first one that we have here is, is that, you know, the, for a, the neutral axis, that's what this line across here is, okay? There will be no normal stress associated with the moment, all right? Because that's the location of zero strain and zero strain is zero stress, all right? And so you would get a stress element that looks something kind of like this guy here, okay? And so this is actually a maximum principal shear stress element, okay? But the cracking phenomenon is tied to the maximum principal normal stresses. And so you would have to use, you know, the, the, the transformation equations or a more circle or something to turn this element into this guy. Okay, and it turns out that for a pure shear element, then we could say that I could rotate this element, you know, assuming no normal forces, that we would get a principal element with something like this. I would have a maximum tension in this direction, okay, inclined at 45 degrees, and a maximum compression in the perpendicular direction to that. Okay, and so what happens is you can see that these are the principal tensiles. These will be the largest values of tensile stress that are possible on this more, on this element. Okay, and so what happens is, is then the crack would form somewhere along that direction. Okay, and that would be the formation of the crack. Now, if you consider, you know, number two, number two is a little bit different. It has the same basic shear stress element, but it also includes this tensile stress that's acting on here. And so, now the shear, the, the shear stress that we put on here is a little bit different than the shear stress that was on this, but you can see that this element also experiences a principal arrangement of stresses, but the angle is no longer 45 degrees because of the inclusion of that normal stress, okay, and even the, the maximum stress will be some limiting value as well because of, the, of that. Okay, um, if you go all the way down to, and the one that we're gonna look at that's kind of a special one, let's include the one here at the bottom on this, okay? And so what happens is, is the stress element on this guy looks something like this, okay? In which, you know, if we call 
I think we're using some value. Okay, can't quite read my writing. Uh, it's a T. You know, as the tensile stress on this guy. Okay, well, if you look at this element for, you know, if this is number three and that's number three, this would be the, the stress element. And this is a principal stress element. So what happens here is the cracking would occur that way. And that's why in simply supported beams, you know, under flexure, you know, out in the middle, the first cracks that form are always vertical because that principal stress out of this extreme fiber where that principal stress is maximum are horizontal, which means that the crack has to be perpendicular to that because basically you're trying to pull this block apart on, on that. And so that's kind of kind of the approach. So everything comes back to these mechanics, materials, principles, and you know, more circle and transformation equations as kind of the basis for what it is that we're going to try to do. All right. All right. Now, continuing on, okay. Research has shown that the average shear stresses in areas of large shear and small moment, okay, which would be places near the neutral axis, okay, that the maximum shear stress in concrete, and this is written several different ways, going back to our mechanics approach, I'll call it tau max, but in other books, they'll sometimes call this as, you know, a critical shear stress, a VCR. Kind of, kind of equation, and they calculate this not using VQ over IT, but they use the, the formula that, you know, one formula that you'll remember back from mechanics is that tau average was V over A, okay? And what that does is that approximates the stress distribution as being basically uniform across the entire section, whereas for tau equal to VQ over IT for a given section, the stress distribution looks more like that. Okay, which it's zero at the top and maximum there at that point. All right, and so rather than dealing with this formula, a lot of times we choose to use off of this average formula. But what we found is is that the, the maximum stress on this, if we call this, they call it tau max, but it's actually an average. It's a different value for the two equations. Okay, it's just the applied shear over B times D. Again, that's for a rectangular section, right? And when they do that, this research has shown that this limit is somewhere around three and a half square root of F prime C. Okay, and that correlates really well with our uniaxial tensile stress that we talked about, the limit of four root F prime C. So that is a, you know, it's a fairly close value. And so it becomes kind of the basis for what we're gonna work on. All right, okay, now in areas of large moments, which would be our flexure locations, okay, they find out that the inclusion of those those um, flexural stresses, that the maximum shear stress or the critical shear stress is going to be VCR over BD again is around 1.9 root F prime C. Okay, and what we'll find out in ACI is that you'll start seeing the number 2 root F prime C running around in a lot of calculations for stress. Okay, and that's a direct correlation back to this guy. They're going to let you overestimate a little bit, but they're going to handle that with safety factors and reduction factors and those kind of things. So the formulas that ACI is using come back to these basic mechanics approaches for what's happening, what we have happening here. All right, so let's consider our first scenario in which we have beams without re web reinforcement. Now, web reinforcement in concrete is often referred to as a stirrup, okay? It comes in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, but we're gonna consider just the plain concrete beam and look at kind of some of the, some of the, the, the distributions of a series of tests, okay? And so what we've done is, is we've varied, um, the A over BWD equation here versus a BC over square root F prime C BWD. So we're looking at basically a study of tests involving involving that coefficient that's out in front here. All right. And so if we look at what we have happening here, we've plotted in a line of two root F prime C BWD. That's what ACI is going to attribute to the capacity of the concrete, this line. And you can see that a lot of the majority of the test results that they have, especially as this A over BWD value gets larger, that uh, it becomes a good lower bound for all the test results that we have. And this is based off of, you know, a study done on a lot of different research that's happening now. What happens when I get into these smaller areas is that now we start having some other phenomena happening and the test results are a little bit lower. So up to about this point, this model does really, really good in predicting, you know, a lower bound limit. So if I assume the concrete strength is two root F prime C, then I'm good for all of the cases from about here over, okay? So, and then we'll just have to figure out, well, what do we do in these other cases? And so that's what we're gonna kind of look at on those, all right? Okay, so that's kind of some of our basic studies. Now, based on these values, okay, ACI is gonna allow for two different methods for calculating concrete's contribution to the shear capacity. 
Okay, and they, they label that guy as VC. Okay, you saw it in the last figure. Okay, and this comes out of ACI 22.5.5. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a couple of the methods. We're going to mainly use the simplified method, but I'm going to show you both of the formulas to say that you so that you've seen them. All right, so ACI 22.5.5.1, the concrete stress or the, the concrete capacity VC is going to be two. There's that two again times lambda root f prime c times bwd. So if you rearrange this a little bit, that's VC over BWD is equal to 2 lambda square root of F prime C, all right? Well, that's basically your sigma, or what they were calling T in the last in the, in the last graphics. Okay, but that's all they're doing. This is that average stress guy. So this is the arrangement of all the pieces. They just kind of rearranged the formula a little bit. All right, now, the lambda is a, a factor for depending on whether you're using lightweight concrete or normal weight concrete. If you're using lightweight concrete, then this lambda changes value. Uh, because its strength is a little bit different than what it is for normal weight. So we have to adjust things just ever so slightly. Okay, so for what we're doing, lambda is 1.0 for normal weight. And everything we do for this class mainly will be, be lambda 1.0. Okay, but you can see um, the section 19.2.4.2 for more information on that equation. All right, so that's the simplified method, not bad. Okay, the detailed method includes finding out um, uh, several different ways for for computing or calculating the VC value, okay? And again, this comes out of 22.5.5.1, okay? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna choose the smaller of these three equations, okay? And if you notice, again, we have two root F prime C, okay, plus, and there's, you know, this one involves a, you know, a reinforcement ratio characteristic, um, but it also includes a moment term on this one. And I know it's kind of small to read, um, but you can you can pull these up out of the code and, and take a look at them. But this one includes a flexure shear interaction value, okay. Um, whereas this one is um, has a, some reinforcement ratio tossed in to, to help things out. And then we have the three and a half root f prime c bwd equation that we saw on the last one. This is that experimental result. So a lot of what they are doing here, and you're allowed to ch choose the smaller of the three of these, okay. Actually, you're required to choose a smaller of the three as a conservative estimate. Okay, and again, what these are trying to do is trying to correct some of the values that were down on the left end of that plot that I showed you guys to in order to make that a little bit safer. So instead of having just a flat two root F prime C line across that graphic, it now kind of angles up a little bit. And this will be an attempt to kind of try to capture those points and provide some safety in the prediction model. Okay, now for many, for most normal situations, uh, designers typically assume that that secondary term in this equation, that 2500 uh, rho w vu over d, or vu d over mu equation, is taken as being equivalent to about 0 0.1 and then lambda square root of f prime c. Okay, this is what the experimental research shows. So you're not talking about a huge amount here. You know, what is this, about 5% okay, of the shear capacity comes from that reinforcement ratio and this interaction between shear and moment. Okay, and so when you do that, if you look at back at this first formula, if this second term becomes 0 0.1 and that number becomes 1.9, well, we're back to the 2 lambda f prime c value, okay? So it's, it's where it's coming from is it's kind of these assumptions that we're making and why the simplified method says, hey, if you're willing to take the worst case, you know, and you know, you can see that looking at this equation, if I have a really big flexural moment on this thing, I can bottom out that value. So, you know, if you're willing to take the penalty of this extra portion added on, for this relationship, then you're allowed to just jump straight to using that simplified equation. But you don't have to, so depending on kind of, for most for most cases, the simplified equation is, is more than sufficient. Okay, all right. So how does ACI consider the nominal shear capacity of a concrete beam? Okay, well, we know that concrete, uh, reinforced concrete is a combination of two materials. And so, as you might expect, the shear capacity then is based on the shear strength of both of those materials. Where VC is that concrete portion we just talked about. And then VS is the extra that is provided um, from any transverse stirrups or shear steel that's applied to the cross section. Okay, so in our last example, if we didn't have any shear steel, then you would only be allowed to account for that. Because once you crack, you're done. Okay, and so that would be the capacity. But if I put stirrups in, you know, number three at 12 inches or number four at six or whatever it is, I start getting some extra capacity from that steel, and that's a good thing. Okay, but there are some limits that are going to be placed on this VS. Okay, all right, now, so that's how we calculate the nominal capacity. Um, like with moments, okay, we do have to consider strength reduction factors, but the good news is, is that whenever we have 
sheer a shear case that's non-seismic related, we're allowed to take fee equal to 0 0.75. So it's just a constant fee. It's no longer tied to the strain in the seal. It's just a flat 75% of the value. Okay, if you have a seismic case in which the design shear comes from that case, then fee is automatically dropped to 0 0.6. And part of that has to do with those load reversals that we talked about in one of the other videos that, you know, things that were in tension get thrown into compression and vice versa, that, you know, basically that changes the orientation of your cracking and can be an issue with the steel. Um, for that, okay, and but you know, this is just the first of many different design provisions the ACI has for seismic criteria. Now, we're not going to talk a, a whole lot about that in this series, but you know, just kind of be aware of it. Um, for most of what we're doing, fee of 0.75 will be more than sufficient, okay? All right, so now, how are the internal forces in a beam with a stirrup determined? Okay, and so I pulled out a, a graphic here, okay. Um, Oh, well, I'm thinking about the seismic provisions. Um, you can find those in 18.6.4 for some detailing requirements for seismic. Again, that goes for columns and beams as well, but that's where a lot of this, some of the especially seismic provisions, and have to do with how stirrup steel is arranged and how you know it's laterally braced and, and those kind of things. All right, but let's go talk about the internal forces in an uncracked beam with stirrups. All right, or do I say in a crack beam? Okay, so if we imagine a crack that started and formed such as like this. This is what we call an inclined flexural crack, where I have a little bit of flexure and then it turns over and becomes kind of horizontal. Okay, that when I when this thing cracks, okay, all of the stresses that occur between this concrete and this concrete disappear and or are reduced. Okay, once this crack opens too wide, you lose all of your your interlocking and, and those kind of things. But if we look at the components of what's happening on this, you can see there there are several different pieces of this. Okay, so the first thing that we have is up on this point, so again, we're looking at a positive moment, tension in the bottom, compression in the top. The VC, or the concrete contribution, is the shear capacity that's happening across that little block area. Okay, we get our compressive resultant from the Whitney block, and then we get a shear block that occurs, some sort of shear stress in the concrete at that location. This is the uncracked concrete strength. Okay, we also get a shear force in the stirrup steel because once I crack it the only thing holding this to this becomes that shear force and so that will be a component that we look at. Um, while the crack is fairly small there is some interlocking that happens because this crack is not smooth and you get these little jagged edges that on this side will interlock with the ones on the other side that match it usually okay and so there's this interlocking or this um, what they call an aggregate interlock component that will happen. Okay, now, like I say, this becomes dependent on the crack width, and so a lot of times what we do is we just neglect the crack width contribution, you know, um, of this, and just call that zero, because, you know, if I can't, you know, count on it to be a certain value all the time, then we don't, just as a conservative estimate, that's one of the things we do. Okay, and then another one that happens then is there is a direct shear component that goes across the longitudinal bars, okay, and this is what we call a dowel force, okay, that the shear is pushing down, and so it's going to take this bar and it's going to try to pull this. Um, downwards and so what often happens in this in this scenario is is that as the beam nears the end of its life as these cracks have grown you know and get back into this area what it will happen is that crack will grow to here and then it will start to turn this way because that dowel force will start to show up and you'll start getting kind of a horizontal crack that occurs right along the line of the rebar as this bar is basically trying to pull the bottom of this thing out and so those are the kind of our major components. So we've got the, con the, the uncracked concrete capacity, we've got the aggregate interlock, we've got the stirrup steel, and we've got these dowel forces. Okay, so again, a lot of times what we do is we neglect the aggregate interlock and we also neglect the dowel forces. Okay, because depending on the stage and the life of it, you know, if we're toward the end of the life of the beam and that cracks way over here, this dowel force is very, very small, you know, of what it's capable of resisting. So we just neglect those two components and we get back to just being left with the VS and the VC which was the equation that you saw here. Okay, and so that's kind of basic. But there are actually, in research, there's a lot of extra terms that get slapped on the end of this thing for all sorts of different factors. Okay, now, this is for the reinforced concrete. Um, you do get some extra shear capacity from um, um, pre-stress beams, in which, you know, I have, you know, a pre-stressing strand that has an extra pre-compressive force. I can drape the strands and get a strand in here up at an angle, and so now, when that happens, the forces in the bar, I get a vertical component that actually helps with shear capacity. So an advantage of pre-stressing is an increase in the shear capacity as well. But again, that's a, a topic for another video, but there are lots of components to this. But for us, in our study of ACI, we're going to deal only with the concrete and the stirrup steel. Okay, for our section there. Okay. 
All right, now, one of the things that they do, because okay, shear is based around cracking behavior, okay, is ACI, you know, if you, uh, locates what they call a critical section for shear. Okay, now, from analysis, from your structural analysis classes, you know that for a simply supported beam that's uniformly loaded, okay, the shear diagram looks something like this, in which the maximum shear always occurred at the location of the support, okay? But that was assuming an infinitesimally small support width, okay? But in reality, what's happening is, you know, that for theory, for theory that was a good, a good value, but in practice, this guy might be sitting on a column that's, you know, 24 or 36 inches wide, right? And so using this value over this column isn't as good as using the one that's here, okay? And so you actually get a reduced limit out here at the face of this column, and so we're going to take advantage of that, and ACI lets us do that. Okay, so, so what we're saying here is that for theory, the maximum VU has always occurred at the center line of the supports, the theoretical value. However, in practice, that simple support looks more like something like this, okay? And so that's the nature of what we have. And I know this picture is a little bit busy, but you can kind of see, hopefully see all the parts, is that I have, you know, I have my supports, which are typically a column or something, and this girder goes into the columns on this and what happens is is that you know there will be some sort of flexural steel which is this line coming across the bottom here and it's located as always at distance d from the top down to there so again we're looking at a rectangular cross section there's my as that's my d okay and so what they say is is that you know if we know that this beam is going to crack you know let's take the worst possible location for a shear crack which is out toward the end where the shear stresses are highest is that I'm going to get a crack that's normally oriented at about 45 degrees, okay? And so what happens is, is that if I imagine that as kind of an imaginary line moving, you know, up and to the right on this left end here, that if I have a load that's sitting on the portion that's above this crack, the shear that's in here, it's by nature is just going to kind of flow in on its own through arching action into the column support, okay? And then, you know, whereas anything that's out in this area is going to have a problem getting back to the support location, all right? We need to come up with a mechanism that gets those forces into the steel, and then the steel will transmit it over to the column, all right? So what we do is what they allow you to do is they say, well, all right, well, if we know that this distance is D and this crack is 45 degrees, then the worst place that this crack can be is at the starting exactly at the reinforcing line and then moving its way back, okay? That at 45 degrees, it's also a distance of D over, all right, so that's why they say that, you know, and this line would be all the way up to the top. So that's why the critical location for shear, according to ACI, is located at D from the support. Okay, and that's our critical location. So if we kind of modify our shear picture, and we'll come back to this picture time and time again as kind of our starting point and our basis for when we get into the design for, the, for, the, for these tensile values. Okay, and so what we have is here's our shear diagram again. Here was the VU that was at the center line of the support, and here's a VU at the other end at the center line of the support, we come in a distance of D from the face of the support. So it's D from the face of the support plus half of the support distance if it's a rectangular section. All right, so that's a fairly big chunk, and I can drop this by you know, as much as 10 or 15% sometimes, depending on your dimensions relative to your span. Okay, and so this becomes our V critical. This becomes our what we're gonna call as our VU. Okay, where this was the max from theory, this is the VU that we use. So there's a little bit of structure and a little bit of geometry you got to do to figure out this reduced value. Now, in practice, if I wanted to design for this guy, I could. I'd just be paying a little bit extra for, you know, expecting higher loads, which might lead to a slightly higher section or a slightly higher steel value. So, you know, when I'm doing a preliminary design for shear, often I'll take this value and kind of work with it just kind of as a first guess to let me know if my section size is about right or if I'm getting you know, into some situations where reinforcement's gonna be a ridiculous amount. It gives me a good, a good theoretical starting point, but when you start sharpening your pencil and doing it correctly, this is the design to use. So make sure you note that that's the guy that you need to use, not the one that's here. Okay. All right, welcome back. In the last video, we were talking about the incline tension for for shear analysis and we focus mainly on on the concrete contribution to the capacity of a reinforced concrete section all right and if you remember the simplified method that we had in that equation said that bc was equal to two root f prime c bwd okay in this section um we're going to be focusing on the vs term this is that nominal shear capacity equation which we said was 
the concrete contribution plus the shear contribution. And so we're going to start trying to quantify what this VS guy is. Okay, and so what you're going to find in ACI is that they scatter a lot of the the topics across multiple sections throughout the book, and it can be a bit of a challenge to find, you know, a particular section. But I've tried to pull some of the highlights out of this, and we'll talk about some of the exceptions, and we'll talk about kind of try to explain why they're doing what they're doing from a mechanics approach. Okay, so keep this formula in mind, this two root f prime c b w d, and we'll come back around to that here in a little bit. All right. So the first provision that we look at is the the minimum web reinforcement criteria, okay? And this is coming out of ACI 9.6.3. So if you notice, we've already switched to a completely different chapter from you know, the chapters of the last video, okay? And that's just one of the, the ways that ACI has laid itself out in these, in these more recent versions of the code, okay? But in particular, we want to be looking at table 9.6.3.1, okay? And what these are, these are the cases in which minimum shear steel is not required, okay? Assuming if we are between half of VC and full VC. Uh, if our applied load or our, our factor load or VU at the critical section is above VC over two and less than VC. Okay, if we're in that region, we have to provide some minimum amount of steel, except for the cases that are located um, in here. Okay, first one is is that if we have a shallow depth, meaning that the the member is less than ten inches thick. So this is a slab. Okay, we don't have to meet the AB minimum requirement for that. Okay, if it's integral with the slab, then if H is less than the greater of, you know, two and a half times the slab thickness or a half of the, the beam width and H is less than or equal to 24 inches, we don't have to provide minimum steel. Okay, and then there, you can read through the rest of these for those. So these are kind of the exception cases. Most often in a normal flexural member design, you won't meet the criteria here. Okay, occasionally, you know, like I say, if you're starting to look at like phenomenon in slabs, you're getting into something called punching shear. Um, you have to do things a little bit differently design-wise anyway, but for this we don't have to worry about providing a minimum amount of steel. Okay, so here's the kind of the gist of it, and this, I box this for a reason because this is probably one of the most important concepts in this, is that if the applied shear exceeds one half of phi times VC, this is that design concrete capacity term, where VC is that two root F prime C that I showed you earlier, okay, a minimum amount of reinforcement must be supplied in the web, okay, these are our stirrups if you will. Okay, for non-pre-stress members, okay, which we're going to talk about in 9.6.3.3, okay, the minimum amount of steel that has to be provided is the greater of these two equations, okay, and it's 0 0.75 F prime C BW S, where S is the stirrup spacing divided by the tensile stress limit of the stirrup itself, okay, and the greater of that value and 50 BWS over FY. So this term's kind of a constant thing. Okay, now if you kind of look at this, this BWS is, you know, again, if we're looking at kind of a rectangular section, this is BW. Okay, and if my beam is trucking down three dimensionally at this direction, and I have a stirrup that's in this plane, okay, and then the next stirrup is down here on this, that's S. Okay, that's the S dimension between stirrups, so the stirrup spacing is S. All right, so what they're doing in this formula, if you look at it, is we're taking, we're limiting the stress in the steel to a limit that is 75% of F prime C or 50 PSI, okay, of BWS over FYT. So this becomes kind of an area, and it's basically the tributary area associated with one stirrup if you will, because every one of these is responsible for, so this guy would be responsible for a half of an S here and presumably another half S there for a full S in between, okay? And so that's what they're doing is they're figuring, they're limiting the stress associated with a single stirrup to this limit on here. Okay, now, kind of as a practical consideration for stirrups, when it comes to detailing and things, normally we like to try to keep our stirrup sizes to a number three or a number four. If you get into bigger bar sizes than this, you know, for 12 inch wide beams, it becomes very hard to get those bars turned and developed and make those 90 degree bends without giving up a lot of space. So normally from a construction standpoint, a number three or number four is probably the most practical. Um, not always, but for the most part, for normal flexure members, this is, is it can be, it gives you a, a decent spacing requirement without getting things too close together and gives you some room to work with while providing the strength and safety that you're counting on. Okay. All right, so as we described, okay, the, t the values FYT is the FY of the web steel, 
which can be different than the longitudinal. Normally this is 60 KSI, and then S is the center to center spacing of the stirrups. Okay, now one thing to point out is that the equations that are shown in table 9.6.6.3, they're rearranged a little bit differently than this. I rearranged this formula, and the reason I did that is so that you could kind of see this BWS connection that are happening. The table where these equations come out of, this 9.6.6.3, they recorded as an AV minimum per spacing. All right, so you can look at inches squared per you know, inch kind of calculation. And so this S won't be there. The S will be hidden. And it's not obvious. You know, even looking for it, I almost missed it when I saw that. So just be mindful that a lot of what we do in shear and even in torsion design is based on an A over S calculation because then I can choose my stirrup size and then that sets my ass and then we're easy to go. So just be mindful of that little limit. You'll see this kind of is up in the, in the caption of the, of the table where they where they mention that. So just be, be very, very mindful of that. It's really easy to overlook. Okay. All right. So that's our minimum web reinforcement. Okay. Now they do have a scenario where they also limit the maximum because they don't want you choosing a concrete section and then just, you know, you know again, because we're looking at VN equal to VC plus VS, basically going in and saying, well, I'm just going to overload this number and then I don't have to worry about VS, okay? Or I'm going to limit this guy to some small amount and I'm going to drive this guy to some astronomical value of VS, okay? They don't want you doing that because, again, we're always worried about ductile behavior. And if I put too much steel into a section, the steel won't yield, but I will get the crushing phenomenon on the concrete. And remember, we always said that crushing in concrete is the limit state that we don't want to have. So they're going to put a limit on the amount that you can count on on VS, okay, this maximum web reinforcement. And when they do that, they say that the capacity, let me get this out of here so it's not distracting, that the ultimate stress at that critical location is going to be less than or equal to phi. Now, again, this becomes my VN. So if you look at it, this piece of it right here is basically VS, okay, and what we call is VS maximum on there. So you're, limit, you're allowed to limit this to 8 root F prime C BWD, okay, it becomes the maximum that you're looking at. Now you notice that it has nothing to do with really the stress associated, that the only way I can get more VS is to change B or change D. This is a geometric cross-section check to make sure that you're not putting too small a section and then just overloading and plugging a lot of steel into it to try to make up for the reduction in this VC. You can want a good balance because we're limited to 2 root F prime C BWD here, and then I'm going to limit my steel portion to four times that value. Okay, so in reality, we want this to be 10 square root F prime C BWD times V as an absolute maximum. Okay, in fact, this becomes a real handy equation for checking the dimensions that you've chosen for a beam at the very, very front end. If you know your shear load, and I choose a BW and a D, I can find out if I'm going to be okay, okay, just by plugging into this formula very quickly without ever getting into the actual detailing and the spacing and some of the other considerations that come, all right? So, so it's pretty, pretty handy. So this is going to require then that, so like we said, our VS maximum then is less than phi and then 8 root F prime C BWD, okay? So basically we're going to count on the stirrup steel to do most of the work in a cross section um, when it does work, okay. Now, if we if VS exceeds the limit, basically that means that your beam dimensions are too small. You must increase either F prime C, B W, or D instead. Okay, the biggest bang for the buck being in the D term or the B term, typically. Okay, all right. So that's what this is. This is a dimensional check on there. All right. So let's figure out then what's the shear strength that's due to the web steel with VS. So we're going to take our nominal equation again. We're going to rearrange it a little bit. So again, VU over phi, this guy here is VN. And so if I take VN minus VC, I get VS. I want VS greater than that amount. Okay, that's the provision in 22.5.10.1. So now we're back to 22 as our section, okay. And so our VS capacity will be calculated by the following equation, that it's AVFY D divided by S. So the stirrup spacing affects greatly the shear capacity value, okay? D is kind of set by the dimensions, and A is the size of the stirrup. So here's that A over S equation again that we were talking about earlier, that it's kind of sneaking around in here. And again, a lot of times we just solve for A, B over S, and then I plug in, oh, it's a number three, here's what the S needs to be. It's a number four, here's what the S needs to be, and so forth and so on. Okay, now the one thing that, to look at that's a little bit different, okay, is, is that AV is the number of stirrup legs, okay, multiplied by the area of the stirrup, because when we make a stirrup,
Okay, basically we take a single bar and we bend it multiple times to form, you know, this is a two-legged U stirrup, okay? And this would be you know, some sort of four-legged arrangement, which I have a bar here, 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 and here. This has four legs. Okay, the shear capacity is assumed to be acting, you know, you know that, if, that our crack crosses the stirrups at this dotted line location, that I would cross this one at two places, and I'll cross this one at four places. So the number of legs go into, you know, our AB term. That's this term here, the number of stirrup legs. The area of the stirrup, this would be like the area of a number three, or the area of a number four as a single bar. You know, to be able to count on what the AB is. So the number of legs, so at this point you gotta start making some decisions on you know, how many legs am I gonna need and, and so forth and so on. And that gets into some of the detailing requirements that, you know, from some of those other sections that we've showed you. Okay, now most often, um, especially in like seismic considerations or even in columns, you'll get this double stirrup arrangement, okay? In which case you have four legs, not just two, but for flexural members, you know, of normal proportions and normal sizes, often I can get away with a number two, or, or sorry, a two-legged number four or number three bar to be able to do that. But So be very mindful of this AB. You gotta watch that subscript, all right? See, AB, you know, it's the number of legs times the area of the stirrup. It's not just the bar by itself. Okay, so that's that piece. Okay, so the maximum spacing of stirrups, okay, again, if we look at um, coming out of section 9.7.6.2.2, get that down here where you guys can see it, okay, it's basically a rearrangement of that previous provision, the 9.6.3.3. Okay, so what happens is, is that it basically breaks it down into, well, are you in a heavily loaded shear situation or a lightly loaded shear situation? And so they chose the limit, VS, as being less than or equal to 4 root F prime C BWD. Okay, and so for us, this is a lightly loaded situation. Recognize that 4 root F prime C, that's that uniaxial, that, that, that principal tension value that we talked about in the last video. Okay, so if our v, if we find out that our Vs is less than this limit, okay, I'm allowed to choose the smaller of these three criteria for the spacing. Okay, this maximum spacing S is going to be equal to AVFYT over 0 0.75 square root of F prime C BW, less than or equal to AVFYT over 50 BW. If you recognize those formulas, this is just a rearrangement of the, those minimum requirements that we saw on the previous page. Okay, but now I've instead rearranged the equation and solve for S max. Okay, it's the, the smaller of this guy, or D over 2, the depth over 2, and what this does, again, remember how we talked about that critical section being out at a distance of D. Okay, that if we assume that the crack is 45 degrees and it will span a distance of D, by limiting the spacing to D over 2, I'm guaranteed to have a stirrup that crosses that crack somewhere in between. All right, and I may, I may get more than that, but by going D over 2, that ensures that, you know, if, if the next crack is over here, I'm guaranteed to get at least one crossing that crack by maintaining that spacing. Okay, and then ultimately you're a maximum spacing then of 24 inches. Okay, and this doesn't show up often, but it, it can play a role. It's usually these first two that start to play value. So that's for if the scenarios where VS is less than that number, the lightly loaded shear cases. For cases where VS is greater than that limit, so now we're going greater than 4 root F prime CBWD, we're now we're choosing the smaller of, again, the smaller, that first equation doesn't change. Okay, but when we go into heavily loaded shear values, they start to limit the S maximum as being a D over four limit, as opposed to what we had up here, which was D over two when we were lightly loaded. Okay, so they're gonna clamp down on you if if you're starting to get um, larger values. And again, this is a, a check on BWD to make sure that we're not making this too small and counting on stirrup seal to do too much work for us. So D over four is a limit, and then S max is, is a limit of 12 inches as well. So anyway, those are some of the basic requirements for, um, for steel detailing and for, for the stirrup steel capacity uh, according to the ACI provisions. And this one's kind of a short video, but I think it was a little bit too much to add on to the end. So as always, if you'll take a look at the, um, tossing us a like or a subscribe to our channel, we'd greatly appreciate it. And we'll continue on with our shear discussion and get into some calculations and some designs in the next video. So anyway, have a great afternoon, and we'll talk to you all later. Happy engineering. Thank you.